helpful. Uh, and I'm going to switch myself over to speaker mode. Um, and I'm also going to share my screen. So let me start with, um, I'm going to share my PowerPoint. And what I want to do um, in terms of what we're going to be talking about in this class, um, which has been titled Yiddish in America, um, is we proposed, and this actually started a while ago, uh, Randy Ashton Pritting sort of said, you know, there's been some inquiries about, could you do a class about Yiddish? Um, and so I said, I'd be happy to do a class about Yiddish. Uh, and we decided that it would be interesting to do a class that looked at, in some sense, the history of Yiddish in America. Um, and it's kind of a cultural history, but as we know through cultural history, there's a lot that we can learn about Jewish life in America over, let's say approximately the last 120 years through the lens of what has happened to Yiddish in America. It can tell us a lot about the interaction between the Jewish community as it comes to America, the interaction between Jewish culture with the American environment, the way that Yiddish has been transformed by the encounter with America and the way in which uh, America has transformed Yiddish. So what I'd like to do in this class is use Yiddish as a lens and the Yiddish language as a lens to understand the nature of that relationship, the nature of that sort of interaction between a language and a people and its culture with the surrounding environment, which is gonna tell us a lot also about the processes of assimilation and acculturation and the ways in which um, uh, you know, a minority culture is forced to adapt and change. But it's also gonna tell us a lot about the ways in which that minority culture um, you know, changes uh, uh, the, the, uh, the society around itself. Um, just wanna see one thing. I'm going to, I wanna make sure. So now everybody sees me, yes? I'm on the middle of your screen. Is that right? In the speaker mode along with the PowerPoint. Yeah. yeah, you're down in the corner uh, of Good. an iPad. Okay, anyway. but you see the you see me and you see talking and you see the the PowerPoint. So I'm going to keep it that way for okay. now. Um, oh, okay. Spotlight exactly. <laughs> so, um, so I chose to to start with this um, sign, which is admittedly a little bit outdated. Um, but for those of you who are familiar with driving in and out of Brooklyn, uh, this is the sign uh, that says when you're leaving Brooklyn, Oy vey. And I thought it was sort of an appropriate way for us to start a class that looks at uh, Yiddish and what has happened to Yiddish in America. I um, propose that today we're going to do some background history because I am not, um, it was not a prerequisite for enrollment in this class that everybody had to know Yiddish before the class. I didn't think that would be fair. So what I'd like to do is provide some background history on Yiddish and the Yiddish language. I'm not going to assume any sort of prior knowledge. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of background history on Yiddish and the Yiddish language before we transition to talking about the great wave of migration of Jews coming from Eastern Europe to America at the end of, let's say, from 1880 to 1920, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th centuries, where we have this huge wave of Yiddish-speaking Jewish immigrants coming to America. That's what we're going to focus on today after I do my background on um, the history of Yiddish. Next week, um, we're going to pick up with what happens to Yiddish and the encounter with American culture and society before and after the Second World War. And so um, I've shared with you a short story by Isaac Besheva Singer, some background material on Isaac Besheva Singer, but we're also going to look at the ways in which Yiddish plays a role in informing, influencing American culture and the ways in which Jewish immigrants both use the Yiddish language and use what I would call kind of a Yiddish cup, which is both a Jewish head, a Yiddish head, a humorous sensibility to make a major impact on American culture. So we'll look at that next week. And then in two weeks, we're gonna fast forward to the present day and ask the question, what has happened to Yiddish in America today, right? What is the state of um, Yiddish in America today and try to understand is Yiddish making a comeback or not? And if it is making a comeback, why? And in what form is it making a comeback? So we're gonna to try to do all of those things in the next uh, three weeks. Um, 
So a little bit of background um, about Yiddish and the Yiddish language. And I have to apologize right off the, big, the bat, this is gonna be sort of a crash course in um, Jewish history for us to understand what is Yiddish and where does the Yiddish language come from, even though we're talking about Yiddish in America. So this is a map that um, shows the ways in which uh, Jewish communities came to settle um, in Europe and predominantly in Eastern Europe. And what you're seeing on this map that is in front of you is the process of migration um, in particular from Central Europe, uh, what's marked on the map from the German Empire to Eastern Europe, that is to Poland and Lithuania in particular, um, which these arrows signify. And as you can see on the map, um, the waves of migration from Central Europe to Eastern Europe by Jewish communities take place largely in the 10th and 11th centuries, and then another wave again in the 12th century, another wave in the 13th, another wave in the 14th centuries. In the Middle Ages, um, the main center of Jewish uh, civilization and settlement in Europe is actually in the German Empire. So you can see it here on the map, for example, um, there are three major cities um, along the Rhine River, uh, Speyer, Worms, and Mainz, for example, which are major uh, cities of Jewish uh, settlement in the German Empire um, in the 10th, then the 9th and 10th centuries. Um, by this point in time, the Jewish world is divided into two main areas of settlement. There are the Jews of Ashkenaz, which is uh, Jews of Europe, uh, what will become Central and Eastern Europe. And there are the Jews of uh, Sfarad, the Sephardic Jews, who uh, the other major center of Jewish life is in Spain. And then eventually after the expulsion from Spain, which happens in 1492, that community disperses to uh, the uh, communities around the Mediterranean, North Africa, and um, other parts of the Middle East as well. But we're focused on, because we're talking about Yiddish, we're focused on the creation of a Ashkenazi uh, civilization in Europe. And so what you can see on this map is that we have waves of migration that take place um, from the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries from Central Europe to Eastern Europe. And the major factor that is motivating um, migrate, there are actually two major factors which are always the case in migration, two major factors which are motivating migration uh, from the German Empire to Eastern Europe. Um, you guys, I think, are all muted, so I, I can't sort of do the interactive part of the class. Although if somebody wants to, um, who knows what is motivating migration from Central Europe to Eastern Europe at this point in time? Raise a hand and I'll unmute you. Or you can unmute yourselves. Did anyone get any, is, are you seeing any hands, Avi? Oh, wait, I saw a hand. Uh, yes, this is coming from, okay, this might not work so well, but I think I asked you to unmute. Go ahead and just introduce yourself. It would be, there's Michael Levin. Um, it would be persecution. Persecution, good, okay. So um, the, there are two factors that are motivating migration. And I think what I'll do is I'll unmute everybody later. It's a little hard to, I was trying to play around and see if we could do this. I'll do it later. So there are two factors um, that are motivating migration at this time. One is persecution, um, especially, so for example, the first crusade, which take place in the year 1096, motivates migration of Jews basically to flee destroyed communities along the Rhine River uh, in the German empire. And that is one of what we call for migration reasons, the a push factor, which is pushing Jews out of their places of settlement, persecution, the first crusades, uh, massacres that are taking place of these three major Jewish communities in Speyer, Worms, and Mainz. And then the other factor is economic, which is that Polish nobles are um, looking for uh, Jewish merchants and Jewish uh, um, uh, people uh, experienced with economic development and commerce to develop their vast estates um, in, uh, you know, um, Poland and Lithuania, which is a huge agricultural economy, and they need somebody to manage all the peasants who are working on these um, estates. And so they recruit the Jews to move there. 
Um, now, I mention all of this because there are these two factors. There's persecution, which is motivating Jews to leave, and there is economic development, which is pulling Jews to Poland and Lithuania. And when the Jews move to Poland and Lithuania, what's important about this for the history of Yiddish is that they bring with them a language that is distinct from the language of the locals, a language that's not Polish, it's not Lithuanian, it's not Ukrainian, all the different languages that would be spoken in this time. It is a medieval German that they bring with them. Um, and it's a medieval German, which if we, we would call it a, a Judeo-German, it is a Jewish form of German because it's what we call today Yiddish, but it's a medieval German, which begins to develop as a uniquely Jewish language that uh, has Hebrew words in it, for example. So Hebrew words, Hebrew is the holy language that is used for prayer and religious life and Torah study. And Yiddish comes to be the use as a language of everyday life um, for socioeconomic interaction and for cultural development. But within Yiddish language, you have German as the sort of root language of German, a medieval German. And then added onto it are many layers of a lot of Hebrew words which come from the religious life. And then as Jews move to Eastern Europe, on top of the German and the Hebrew, you start to see a lot of Slavic words being added into it too, as a language grows and develops. You see Polish words, uh, you see words from Russian that are added um, to Yiddish as well. So Yiddish becomes very much a fusion language, right? A fusion language is a language that um, fuses together a number of different linguistic trees, right? So you, it blends them together. At its root, it has medieval German, but then it combines a lot of components to it. Sociologically, Yiddish is also very important in the development of a um, unique culture and a civilization for the Jews as they expand from um, Central Europe into Eastern Europe, because as Jews move from the German Empire with this language and they start moving east towards Lithuania and Poland and Hungary, they're taking this linguistic tradition, they're also taking a distinctive religious tradition, and they're developing a separate uh, Ashkenazi Jewish civilization. And one of the appeals of moving to Eastern Europe for them, the Polish nobles say to them, you're going to manage our estates, um, you're going to help us grow and develop economically, and in exchange, we're going to allow you to live uh, in a way that is very autonomous. We'll give you the ability to govern your own affairs. You will be able to live religious life as you see fit. Your community can be organized according to Jewish religious law, right? You'll have this autonomy. So what you see developing in these Jewish communities around Eastern Europe is uh, so an economic interaction that takes place between the Jews and the surrounding communities. But at the same time, it is a, a community that is insular in a lot of ways. It's insular religiously. It wants to maintain distinctiveness from the surrounding uh, non-Jewish, the surrounding Christian world. And it's insular culturally in that they wanna have a separate language that is just their own language. So uh, Yiddish functions sociologically to distance the Jewish community from the surrounding uh, Polish, Lithuanian, Russian community as well. Um, Jewish religion creates that type of distancing. Uh, Jewish dietary law creates that type of distancing, right? Because if you can't eat and drink with your neighbors, it also prevents a lot of social interaction, which is important for the rabbis, right? They wanna make sure that um, Jewish uh, men are not marrying non-Jewish women, for example, um, which is important for the continuation of the religious uh, tradition. Um, as I said, this is a crash course in the history of Yiddish, but I think it's important for us to, to understand. Um, we see one of the interesting things that happens is as we have this, let's call it a linguistic migration of Jews from Central Europe, um, from the German speaking lands to other parts of Europe, they take this medieval German with them, a medieval German, it's a, a fusion of German and Hebrew language. And then it is fused to a great extent with the languages of the surrounding uh, population. And so that is how you end up with different Yiddish dialects. So you have a shared language that is spoken by Jews all over Europe, 
So that means that you can have a Jew in Northern Italy, right? So if you look on the map here, we can see the Southwestern dialect of Yiddish. A Jew in Northern Italy who is speaking the Yiddish that they brought with them in the process of migration from Germany, that is um, linguistically very similar to the language that would be spoken by a Lithuanian Jew. But just as we know in the American context, you have very different accents depending on where you live and your accents are influenced by the people who, around you. So I grew up in Texas. I don't sound like I grew up in Texas, but the people around me sounded very different than people from Boston, for example, right? That will influence the language in a sense. Um, but also you have words that are added in from the surrounding population. Right, so it's an interesting thing, and we're going to see it even as today when we look at Jewish migration to America. You have a Boston Yiddish, which sounds different from a New York Yiddish, right? As you know, uh, English words make their way into the Yiddish, which is an interesting phenomenon that happens in America. Um, so, you know, that's why we have different dialects. Some of you might be familiar. One of the most famous distinctions. Uh, in terms of linguistic difference in the Yiddish language are the Litvaks. The Litvaks are the Lithuanian Jews and the Galicianers. And the Galicianers are what would be here this sort of um, Southeastern dialect um, between Poland and Ukraine. And you might have heard stories about, um, you know, the Litvaks were had like sort of a, a, they were more meticulous and more rule oriented and they liked things spicy, there's all sorts of things, as compared to the Galicianers, who were more Southern Jews, and um, the Litvaks kind of looked down upon them, and uh, Hasidism was more, um, you know, uh, widespread, uh, mysticism was more widespread in the Southern part of um, the, the Galicianers from Litvak. So um, just some interesting things to pay attention to. Um, a little bit more about Yiddish before I, before I move on. Um, so I'm showing you here a couple of um, sample Yiddish sentences. Um, and let me just see here. Um, okay, so actually it is set up that if, if uh, you want to unmute yourself, you can. So I just need a, a volunteer to try to read um, this uh, first sentence that I've put here. And I actually put it in English uh, transliteration. So Yiddish, just so you can see, um, Yiddish. So for example, this we'll get to in a moment. This is what Yiddish looks like uh, uh, with the Hebrew letters. Um, and uh, okay, I have a couple of questions that have already come in. So I'll pause just to respond to the chat questions that have come in just to address those. But just so you can see here on the screen, um, the Hebrew Yiddish is uh, the sort of German sounding language. So for example, it says here, Vertel soll man wegen und nicht zählen, right? Um, words uh, should be weighed, not counted. But you can see here it's written in Hebrew letters, but written phonetically. So there are no vowels like you have in Hebrew. So for example, the ein makes the E sound, but it's written in Hebrew letters, but sounds like German, okay? Um, and I see just a couple of questions that came up in the chat. So I'll just respond to those before we read some of our sample um, Yiddish sentences together. Um, so somebody, uh, Michelle asks, what do I mean by community granted privileges? Um, very good question. Um, so in the Jewish towns um, and Jewish towns in Eastern Europe um, were referred to by this Yiddish term, uh, a shtetl. A shtetl, what that literally means is a small town. A shtot um, is a city or a town and a shtetl is a small town. Um, and these different Jewish towns where Jews were encouraged to, uh, to live and reside, they were not 100% Jewish. So you could have a town that would have 50% Jews, 50% Christians, but that Jewish community that lived in that town the local noblemen at the time might grant them privileges of protection, right? Say, I, if you work for me and do this type of economic management of my estate for me, I will um, promise to protect you. It obviously didn't always work. And in most cases, when waves of persecution broke out, the nobles would hide behind the walls of their fortress and the Jews would be left to be massacred. But that's a, di that's a different story, which we'll maybe come back to. 
Um, but in times of peace, the privileges worked like this, that we won't, you work for us and we won't meddle with your internal affairs. You can manage your religious life as you see fit. You can set up your schools as you see fit. You can have a great deal of autonomy over your own life. You can enforce that everybody eats kosher food. You can enforce that everybody observes um, the Sabbath laws, right? The rabbi can sort of enforce religious law in the town. You have autonomy in this sense. And it, it's an interesting, set. It, it worked for a couple of hundred years, right? Our, our sense of Jewish life in Eastern Europe is often negative because we know what happens historically. But I would say from the 1500s to the 1700s, Jews do quite well in, in Eastern Europe in terms of developing a culture and a civilization and having a great deal of autonomy. I say that with a caveat that every once in a while there will be outbreaks of horrible violence. So, you know, we, it's kind of how do we interpret that history? Um, the word uh, Yiddish, so interesting question, right? It, it literally means Jewish, right? So a Yid is a Jew um, and Yiddish is Jewish, but it's, uh, in fact, I knew people used to say, like they would say, you know, not, somebody didn't speak Yiddish, they would say somebody spoke Jewish, right? Um, so kind of interesting to think about how that, how that word um, works. I mean, now it becomes a kind of a, an adjective as well, not just a word to refer to a language. Um, so let's, let's go back and look at these sample sentences just to look linguistically at how a fusion language actually works. And you'll notice that I did not, um, I did not translate them. Um, we can try to translate them together. So I'm gonna stop the, the slideshow. So who wants to try to read this first one? You can just unmute yourself and voluntarily start reading if you wanna read. As a goy shiksa, I will try. <laughs> Thank you. Benchen, Benchen, der Zaidi hat gekauft a Zafer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for volunteering. So it says, Noch in Benchen, der Zaidi hat gekauft a Zafer. Okay. Anybody know, anybody want to shout out any of those words? Do you know what any of those words mean? Benchen is lighting the Shabbos candles. Okay, nice. So benchen, benchen, um, and in Yiddish, if you say to bench licht, bench licht, right, means it means that you're you're saying the blessing after, uh, actually before lighting the candles on the Sabbath. Benchen means to bless, right? It literally means to bless. Okay, so we know one of those words. Anybody know? There's uh, there's is of the grandfather. Nice. Okay. There's eighty is um, the grandfather. Good. Means he bought. Nice. Okay. Hot gekauft. He bought. Okay. A, a safer. A book. Oh, you guys are you guys are good. Um, even better than my uh, undergrads who. They have no idea what to do with this, okay? <laughs> Nachen is after. Okay, so and Nachen is after. Okay, so after, let's say, um, after saying the, I'm gonna put that in parentheses, the blessings, after saying the blessings, the Zaidi, uh, Zaidi, the grandfather bought, you actually don't need a book. The grandfather bought a book, okay? Uh, after. No, bought, good click, just bought. Gekauft is bought, right? So noch in Benchen der Zaidi hat gekauft a Sefer. Now, very simple sentence, but what I want to show you is what languages these words actually come from, okay? Um, so uh, nochen, where does that come from after, for after? I think it's German. German, good, okay. So nach, right? N-A-C-H, like nach, Germ after, after. Um, now, Benchen for blessing. And literally, you might be familiar with this if you say to bench, so it's the grace after meals, right? You say to bench, you, when you want to say the grace after meals, you say, I'm going to bench 
it, that actually is an example of a Yiddish word that has made its way, way into English, um, the Yiddish in America. I'm going to bench. I'm going to say the blessings. We'll come back to this word. Where does it come from? It's not German, okay? And How it's about not, Hebrew? What? How about Hebrew? And it's not Hebrew. Good. Is it, Sla is it Slavic? No. Okay. Good guess. Okay, so... Uh, you, you know, we said the three major components are German and Hebrew and Slavic rooted words, and it's none of those three. This is a this is a trick. It's a trick word, by the way. Yeah. Arabic. Okay. No. Okay. We'll come back to it. I'm going to leave it for now, and we'll come back to it. Um, Zaidi for grandpa. Where does that come from? My grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> So that is an example of a, of a Slavic word, um, uh, similar root to what you would see like in Polish or Russian for a grandfather. It, so Yiddish borrowed that term for grandpa from the surrounding Slavic language. How about hotgekoift? German. German, German. good. Okay, so this is, and uh, so, you know, to buy, right? Like the name Kaufman, right, uh, from German. How about um, a safer for a book? Hebrew. Great. Okay. So this is what we would call in Yiddish a loishen koidish word. A loishen koidish word means it's a Hebrew word. Loishen koidish in Yiddish means, anybody know what that means? Loishen koidish? Holy language. Holy tongue. Nice. The holy, literally the holy tongue, the holy language. And in Yiddish, when you were referring to a Hebrew word, you call it loishen koidish, right? Holy language. So you can see here, this is a sentence where we have um, a word, words that are in, uh, sorry, let me just move this. Um, we have words that are in German, bench and we'll come back to, a Slavic word, a German word, a Hebrew word, okay? So let's come back to this bench and for blessing. Where, does, where could that come from? Russia. So not Slavic, this is, this is my trick question. I'm going to show you this map here. Anglo-Saxon? Yeah, why, where do you think that? Well, just looking at the Benshin, it, it resembles um, Chaucerian words. Oh, okay, That's good. All. So um, very well done. So actually what's happening here, do you see this Italy component? Um, we think that this word, how did it make its way into Yiddish for literally to mean blessing? It comes from Latin like benediction, right? Uh, benediction, like remember the Pope, right? Benedict, right? It's a blessing and, and benchen um, looks like it comes from uh, benedictirian, right? To, to, to bless. So really interesting to think about how this works in Yiddish, right? Where you this is what I mean when I say it's a fusion language that is a combination of multiple languages from, it's, a, it's European um, and it borrows from surrounding languages, but it also uses this um, sort of Hebrew uh, Jewish component to make it a specifically Jewish language, right? Um, there's another sentence here, which I won't, uh, I'll just read to you for now. The Ashkenazische um, Talmide Chochomim Hoben Okay, um, this is a very uh, Hebrew heavy, very Loshen Kodesh heavy sentence. Literally means the um, the the Ashkenazi, um, you know, smart students were not impressed by the sort of religious point that was made, and that and presumably they're discussing Talmudic things. This is a sentence that has a lot of Hebrew words in it. So um, Ashkenazi is Hebrew, Talmide, Chachamim is Hebrew, Ataina is Hebrew, um, Nispol Veren, Lehit uh, Pa'el means to be impressed. This is a sentence that has a ton of Hebrew in it. So you have different types of sentences depending on, on the context. Um, all right, let me skip ahead in the interest of, of time and I'll go back to my, to my slideshow. So you can see how Yiddish um, develops at this time in Eastern Europe. Um, and the other thing that I wanna mention is that in the 19th century, before this wave of great migration begins to take place, 
The other thing that begins to happen in Yiddish is we have the development as we have sort of the Jewish encounter with the modern world. We also have the development of a modern Yiddish literature in Eastern Europe in particular. And this really begins to happen in the middle and towards the end of the 19th century. So from the middle, let's say the 1870s until um, 1900, we really see Yiddish literature begin to pick up. And the developments that fuel the spread of Yiddish literature are on the one hand, the encounter with the modern world. Um, uh, writers like the ones who are pictured here, the grandfather of Yiddish literature, Mendele Mocher Sforim, who's in the middle, uh, his name was Shalom Abramovich, um, but his pen name was Mendele the Book Peddler. And next to him is pictured Shalom Rabinovich. His pen name was Shalom Aleichem, which literally means, hey, how you doing? Um, he's most famous for writing the Tevya stories, which become Fiddler on the Roof. And I.L. Peretz, Isaac Labish Peretz, um, who... Uh, some of you might be familiar with his story, for example, of Bancha Schweig, Bancha the Silent is, is one of the more famous stories. Um, these are writers who were raised in religious environments, become secularized, but try to use the Yiddish language to sort of educate the masses on how one remains not necessarily faithful to Jewish tradition, but remains faithful to Jewish history and Jewish culture while becoming a fully functioning part of um, the surrounding world. And this is important because exactly at the time that we see Yiddish literature begin to develop, and one of the major developments in this is the spread of um, the print capitalism newspapers, right? So publishing of newspapers in Jewish towns and cities all over Eastern Europe enables a literary culture to begin to spread at the same time that we see this develop, we also begin to see a great wave of migration from um, Eastern Europe to America. And I show you this picture. So this is Shalom Aleichem on the left, and that's Chaim Topol playing the character of Tevya on the right. This is represented beautifully in the, in the Tevya stories, for example, which become sort of Fiddler on the Roof, where we can see kind of the the beginning of the end of a culture and a civilization that is encountering the modern world, where we have somebody like Tevya who is trying to navigate, you know, how do I raise these girls who all want to introduce one change after another into my life while still remaining faithful to my tradition? And Shalom Aleichem writes these stories in Yiddish for a mass audience. He is incredibly popular in, in Eastern Europe. He's referred to as the, as the Jewish Mark Twain Although supposedly when he came to America um, in the early 1900s and he met Mark Twain, Mark Twain said, oh, I heard I'm the American Shalom Aleichem. So that's a, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, it's, a, it's a story that's often told about the two of them. One of the interesting things about our story is that he's writing this exactly at the time that we see Eastern European Jews begin to migrate in large numbers to America. Um, and Shalom Aleichem actually ends up moving to America as well, twice. He first comes to America um, in the early 1900s, 1905, 1906, uh, to try to make it as a writer in New York, where most of his audience is now migrating from Eastern Europe. And he struggles. He struggles because his stories that he's famous for, like the Tevye stories, kind of represent the old world. And his audience is ready for something new that represents the new world. And so Shalom Aleichem actually goes back to Europe after his first attempt to make it in New York. And then he's in Europe um, and uh, World War I breaks out and he comes back to New York in the context of the First World War and he actually dies in New York in 1916. And when he dies in New York in 1916, it is supposedly the largest funeral that um, New York had seen until then. Something like 250,000 uh, mourners crowd the streets of New York to accompany his funeral procession. 
And he's actually, you can go visit his grave. He's buried in, in Queens at uh, Montefiore Cemetery, which is kind of cool. So um, you can find Shalom Aleichem there. Um, I included here, and I'm very happy to share the slideshow um, with anyone. Um, we also have the video of the slideshow. Um, I'm happy to share with you. I included in here uh, some Yiddish sayings to also convey that we're not only talking about a language that is used for everyday life, and we're not only talking about um, sort of a culture and a civilization, we're also talking about a, a way of thinking, right? Which is um, very intellectual, uh, often quite witty. Um, and I'll, let's, you know, I, I included here a couple of proverbs that kind of reflect this. So, um, for example, um, it, this one says, Sein Wort soll seine stecken, wird man sich nicht getort ansparen, which literally means, if his word were a stick, you couldn't lean on it, which figuratively means he's not to be trusted. I'm not making any political association, I'm just sharing Yiddish proverbs. So um, here's, a, here's another one. Um, no one sees the hump on his own back, which is also quite good, right? In terms of thinking about, um, there's other colorful ways to say that in, in English, which I won't, which I won't say right now. Um, uh, in a shenem apple, gefint menamol avorem, right? Even in a beautiful apple, you sometimes find a worm. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, if grandma had a, had a beard, she would be a grandpa. Now, has anyone heard this one before? Do you know what context this would be used in? What does that mean? What do you think that means? No one know? A domineering mother. Okay, okay, it's not it's not in a Freudian sense. It's not something to complain about your mother. <laughs> <laughs> so the context for this, and uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit more next week when we read Isaac Bashevis Singer. Um, I think I gave you Gimple, Gimple the Fool. Um, so the context for this is if you want to, if somebody says something so outlandish that um, you want to say you know, call BS and say, that's not, I don't believe you. You can say, it's very sarcastic and they'll say their thing that you don't believe and you say, yeah, right. And if my grandma had a beard, she would be my grandpa, right? Um, which is just basically calling someone out on saying something that is completely unbelievable. And you're saying, yeah, right, I don't believe you, right? Um, in, in Singer's story, Gimple Tom, he uses a a different way to say this in Yiddish, which is that if you want to say that something is you don't believe it, you say it's nishkeshtoigen, nishkefloigen. Um, and we'll talk about next week what that actually means um, when we discuss the story. It's an unbelievable, nishkeshtoigen, nishkefloigen. Um, one of my favorite ones also, which I'm challenging now in Zoom times, um, you can't sit on two horses with one behind, or similarly, you can't dance at two weddings um, with one uh, literally, right, with one behind. Um, I will say that I'm challenging this now in Zoom times because I have figured out that you can actually be in two meetings at the same time um, in the current world. You can zoom into one on your laptop and on another one on your phone. So it is possible. So we might have to uh, revise this one um, for our current circumstances. Bobby, right. would, it, would it also, uh, the more boring version of it would be, you can't be a servant of two masters? Yeah, you could, you could say that. I mean, I think actually the, um, this one also kind of represents that, right? Like you can't yes, ride right. in two directions at the same time. Um, but you can also see how like these Yiddish sayings in a very pithy, you know, it, you kind of have a, a, in a few number of words can express a great deal. 
And I think one of the, the interesting things about the Yiddish language is it, it is perceived, and I think quite rightly, to be a very colorful language, right, that expresses a great deal. Um, and it's also a, a language that uh, carries with it a kind of a great deal of intellectual thought, and it's very witty, right? So you have things like this that are expressed um, in, in Yiddish. So all of this is kind of, um, and there's a lot of these, and I'll share these with you, um, but I don't want to uh, go on for now. This is sort of an anti-religious one. Um, the closer to synagogue, the farther from God. Right. So um, again, some people might say this about their rabbis. I don't know. And b'mokam she'en bo'ish is a herring oich fish, where there is no worthy man, even a herring is a fish. Right. Um, another interesting commentary. It's kind of a big fish, small pond. Right sort of how we would say it in, in English. All right, so let me, let me transition and talk about um, what happens when Yiddish comes to America. And thank you for bearing with me, but I felt like we couldn't talk about Yiddish without talking about Yiddish. So now we've talked about Yiddish and now we could talk about what happens when it comes um, to, to America. Um, so as you can see, anybody know where this comes from, by the way, this image? Blazing saddles. Blazing saddles. Thank you. Good. So <laughs> when they when the Jews come to America, they encounter uh, Yiddish-speaking indigenous people, um, as Mel Brooks has shown us. No, that's the famous line from Blazing Saddles, um, where uh, Mel Brooks says, "Laws him gain, right? Let them go," and he's a Yiddish-speaking. And there's actually some interesting commentary which we might get into next week when we talk about Yiddish and American humor. Um, now the truth is, and I love this map, which is a Yiddish map of America, um, which uh, comes from the, I think the American Jewish Historical Society has it in its collections, as does the National Museum of American Jewish History. And this is the type of thing that would be produced for um, either new, newly arrived Eastern European Jews um, to give them some orientation to like, what is this country and what does it look like? And what are all these states? Um, and I think it's quite lovely also to sort of get that sense of you're a, you're a new immigrant and you've heard about these places and this map is going to explain to you where all these places are and how they're pronounced, right? So here at the bottom, we can see Texas, right? For example, um, if you can read the, the Hebrew letters or California out east, uh, out west. Um, so uh, a little bit about sort of what the Jews encounter in this process of migration. And I'm gonna, we'll come back to the Lower East Side in, in a moment when we talk about the um, Kahan story together that we read for them. But a little bit of context that I think is quite important just to give you. Um, we are talking about in large part in this class, this period between 1881 to 1920, when you can see uh, this great wave of migration that comes from Eastern Europe to America increases the population, the Jewish population of America from about 250,000 to by 1923 and a half million. And that is a, a very, I mean, you could talk about sort of proportionally the increase, it's a very substantial rise in the Jewish population of America, especially when we look at what the population was until um, the 1800s. And this is kind of, rep these are estimates. Um, in a lot of cases, we don't have a great count until the later period. But we know that first Jews arrive in New Amsterdam, which later becomes New York in 1654. There are 25 Jews, approximately 23 Jews who land in New Amsterdam um, uh, as uh, fleeing the Portuguese Inquisition in Brazil in 1654. That number increases only gradually up until the time of the American Revolution so you have somewhere between one to 2,500 um, Jews, 1,000 to 2,500 at the time of the revolution. And over the course of the next uh, 70 years in America, it goes up largely um, Jews migrating from Central Europe, the German speaking lands. So that by 1861, during the civil war, when there are 150,000 Jews in America, most of them have immigrated, as you can see over the past uh, 20 years or so, um, mainly from Prussia and Bavaria and Bohemia, Bohemia, Moravia, sort of Central Europe. These are 
German speaking Jews who come. Um, and they tend to be in their religious orientation more likely to be reform Jews. Um, reform uh, grows in prominence as a religious denomination in Central Europe in the middle of the 1800s. And that is the sort of uh, the dominant part of the Jewish community up until 1881. It's, uh, and they do quite well in the aftermath of the Civil War in commerce uh, in particular. So you have a, a very large wealthy class of Jews living in New York who, um, you know, think about like the Lehman Brothers, for example, or um, Meyer Strauss or uh, Guggenheim. These are all um, sort of represent examples of Jews who come in the 1800s. After the assassination of the Tsar, um, Alexander II in, uh, in Russia, in 1881 and an outbreak of pogroms that begins in the Russian empire, a great wave of migration begins from Eastern Europe to America. Um, and this uh, spurs this huge wave of a different type of a Jewish population that starts coming into America. They are largely Yiddish speaking from Eastern Europe. They are more likely to be Orthodox in terms of their traditional religious orientation. Um, and uh, economically, their main sort of training is um, yes, in commerce, but also in the early period of this migration, a lot of them um, work in the, what's called the needle trades um, in uh, tailoring, right? So, um, and the timing of this works out quite well. Around 1900, New York is the sort of garment capital of the world where you have kind of the fashion capital of the world for the time, a booming uh, industry in clothing manufacture. And a lot of the Jews who immigrate to New York at this time are employed in the manufacture of clothing, ready-made clothing, which um, begins only to be sold in department stores around this time. Um, so here's a picture of the Lower East Side, which in a sense, it kind of becomes synonymous with Yiddish in America at this time. Um, why the Lower East Side? Well, the Lower East Side, uh, most of, oh, I see somebody just came in, Bernice Schaefer, okay. Um, most of uh, the, the Jews who immigrate from Eastern Europe to America um, make their way to New York at least 75% of the immigrants make their way to New York. They wanna to go to a place where there is business, um, economic possibility and a pre-existing Jewish community. And the Lower East Side uh, becomes kind of the main landing spot for um, Jews who uh, disembark either at Ellis Island or at other, you know, Castle Rock is another place where earlier Jews are getting off boats. And from Ellis Island, when Jews take the short ferry ride to the lower docks of Manhattan, it is a very short walk from there to get to the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And by um, the early 1900s, you have something like 500,000 Jews living on the Lower East Side. And that geographically, if we can think about this, we're talking about below Houston Street in Manhattan. So 500,000 Jews living below Houston Street on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I mean, this is just a gigantic sort of metropolitan. This is the largest Jewish metropolis in the history of the world, if you want to think about it in that sense, right? It's There are more Jews living on the Lower East Side of Manhattan than there are um, in Warsaw and in Lodge and in Lublin and anywhere else in, in Eastern Europe, right? Or for that matter, anywhere else in the world. Um, so, you know, we have to think of this as sort of this bustling metropolis. Um, there's a tendency to see it in very nostalgic terms. And one of the reasons that I wanted us to read together the story by Abe Kahan is I think that he kind of dispels some of that nostalgia for us. That is that life on, um, the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And it's not just the Lower East Side. I mean, then it becomes so overcrowded on the Lower East Side as Jews are living in uh, tenement um, houses 
that are kind of these ramshackle buildings that are thrown up uh, hastily uh, where you have people living in overcrowded conditions and the hygienic conditions are poor and people are basically living and working in the same place, you know, like in sweatshops where they're basically um, have a sewing machine in the room that is also their apartment and they're producing, you know, uh, trousers or coats or whatever they're supposed to make at the same place from where they live. Kids aren't going to school, they're working in the room. I mean, people are living in intense poverty. So there's also people desperate to leave the Lower East Side. So for example, they wanna, when we saw that opening slide of leaving Brooklyn, right? They're doing the exact opposite. They're trying to cross the bridge to leave Manhattan and get into Brooklyn where there's more space um, and better living conditions. And then Jews spread out from there. The next generation moves up to the Bronx or to North Jersey or eventually post-World War II to Long Island. But New York still is um, to this day the, the center of, of Jewish life in America. Um, so before we look at the story of, of um, the, the uh, ghetto wedding by Abraham Kahan, just wanna say a little bit about Kahan um, as a figure and why he's so important. Um, so you can see here a, a portrait of, of Abraham Kahan. He um, is one of these, you know, quote unquote, huddled masses who immigrates to America um, in the 1880s. Um, he is politically active in uh, the Russian empire and Lithuania. And he basically has to flee the czar's uh, armies and the czar's soldiers um, because he will be arrested and deported to Siberia. So he um, runs away um, and he brings with him kind of a socialist, uh, a Jewish socialist mindset to America where he, um, begins working not long after he immigrates first to Boston and then to New York um, as a journalist. And he gets jobs working for some of um, New York's most prominent newspapers, writing in English. Now I point that out because obviously that's very impressive like linguistically for a new immigrant who's writing in English and writing in the newspapers. Um, but a story like uh, The Ghetto Wedding or a story like some of you might be familiar with um, the story called Yekel, uh, which is a, it's a longer story. So I didn't, it's over a hundred pages, but some of you might know it. It's made into a movie uh, in 1975, this movie called Hester Street. People remember the movie Hester Street? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. By, by Joan Micklin Silver. So that is based on an original story written by Abe Kahan about this guy Yekel who just wants everybody to call him Jake, right? He's an immigrant who, you know, wants to make it in America and he wants to be American. And um, Kahan had a very distinct opinion on what was the right way for one to become a Jew in America and not forget who they were, right? And he becomes most famous. So he writes these stories also initially in English and then translates them into Yiddish also, which is really interesting and impressive, I think. Um, but he comes most famous because he's the editor of this newspaper that I showed before you called the Forverts, um, the Jewish Daily Forward. And Forverts, so you could see here, it's translated into English literally as Forward. And it's known as the Forward. And the Forward is still printed today um, in, in English. And it's largely now, uh, like many newspapers, lives online, right? Um, not in paper. Um, but Kahan is the editor of the Forverts for almost 50 years. And the Forverts is the largest Yiddish circulating newspaper in the world. Um, and it's one of the largest daily circulating newspapers in New York um, when Kahan is the editor in chief. It's a daily newspaper that's published in Yiddish. Um, it carries the news of the day, news of the world, and news that is meaningful for the Jewish community that's living not only in New York, but you could see, for example, here it's in New York and Philadelphia and Jews all over America, um, but it's very much focused on the Northeast and in New York in terms of its coverage. Um, I wanna show you something before we look at the story, kind of neat about this. So I'm gonna change, I'm gonna stop my share um, and I'm gonna share something else with you, which is, um, 
thanks to, okay. You still, you see this where it says the forward and it's a web page, yeah? No. So thanks to the National Library of Israel, which has digitized a collection of um, sort of the, the Jewish press from all over the world, you can actually go to the um, National Library of Israel. You can type in sort of the historical Jewish press into your web browser. Um, you can see here it says historical Jewish press. And you can load, if you're bored at home and looking for things to do, you can load copies of newspapers, millions of pages of newspapers, historical newspapers. So I went to the page of the, um, the Jewish Daily Forward in this archive. It all, it's all been digitized, so it all lives on the internet. And I wanted to pull up um, a part of the newspaper. So this happens to be the Furverts from um, January 1st. Hold on, let me go. Let me go back the other way. This happens to be the Furverts of January 1st, 1907. Okay. Um, and we can see on the headline um, is a story about, uh, let's see. It's a, it's a story about somebody named Miriam Edvina, the beautiful singer, anyway. Um, so, but the part that I wanted to show you that I think is so telling about um, Gahan and what he does is, so you have this whole section in the newspaper that's coverage of the daily, the news of the day, but there's also a section in the newspaper that Kahan has every day that's called, I don't know if anybody's able to read the Yiddish. Anybody see what that says there? Right there. No idea. That's the Bintel brief. Good. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so it says a bintel brief in Yiddish, a bintel brief. And what a bintel brief means is a bundle of letters, a bundle of letters. Die was schicken zu, zu brief seinen uh, gebeten schreiben bloß auf uh, ein Zeit von jeder Blättel. Okay. So every day or almost every day in the newspaper, they would publish um, this quote unquote bundle of letters which were letters to the editor. And Kahan pioneered this letters to the editor idea, just so you know, this sort of interactive function of the newspaper. New readers would send letters to Kahan. They would ask him questions and he would respond. And, um, and there were questions about all kinds of things, personal questions, questions about how to be a Jew in America, questions about what do I do for my family that's still living overseas. So this one says, uh, right? The, the reader, the headline is that they're worried about somebody in their life who has a horrible temper. What do I do about this person? Um, so you can think about this, like this is like a, you know, Dear Abby type. Um, and these have actually been collected. There's a nice publication, which I'll show you here um, before we talk about uh, the story. So, uh, and have been translated into English, right? Um, in which people would send letters to Abe Kahan asking for advice, right? Worthy editor, allow me a little space in your newspaper and I beg you, give me some advice about what to do. There are seven people in our family, parents and five children. I'm the oldest child of 14 year old girl, right? writing to Kahan. We've been in the country two years and my father who is a frail man is the only one working to support the whole family. I go to school where I do very well, but since times are hard now, my father only, only earned $5 this week. I began to talk about giving up my studies and going to work in order to help my father as much as possible. But my mother didn't even want to hear of it. She wants to continue me to continue my education. She even went out and spent $10 on winter clothes for me, but I didn't enjoy the clothes because I think I'm doing the wrong thing. Instead of bringing something into the house, my parents have to spend money on me. I have a lot of compassion for my parents. My mother is now pregnant, but she still has to take care of the three boarders we have in the house. Mother and father work very hard and they want to keep me in school. 
I'm writing to you without their knowledge and I beg you to tell me how to act. Hoping you can advise me, I remain your reader, S. So this is a fascinating letter on so many levels, right? That the tension between her parents wanting her to get an education, she wants to support the family, they're buying me clothes, I can't enjoy them because I feel I should be working, I don't want them spending money on me, what am I supposed to do? And he writes back, <clears throat> The advice to the girl is that she should obey her parents and further her education because in that way she will be able to give them greater satisfaction than if she went out to work. So it, it, this is just one example, right? But you can see how Kahan becomes like this kind of guide for all of those, these immigrants, right? How do I make it in America? Um, people will send them letters and say, life here is so hard, I wanna go back. You know, I want to go back to Eastern Europe and I'll say, you can't go back. Don't ever go back, right? You only have to look forward. It's going to get better, right? So he serves sort of like as this, and he is this, you know, if you've ever done a walking tour of the Lower East Side, you can see the forward building there, um, you know, kind of overlooking the whole Lower East Side. He is kind of like this figure that um, provides this important service. So that's all context for us to, to talk about um, this story. And what I'm going to do, so I'm sharing the screen of the story um, with you, but I'm going to unpin myself. Okay. So now if we, if people want to talk, we're, we can see you um, as you sort of share and discuss the story. So um, I've been talking a lot in my introductory session, and so I want to stop talking, and I just want to um, hear first of all what what people thought of this story, or for that matter, if there are questions about things that I've brought up so far. So let me do this. Um, I'm sharing the the story with you, but I can see all of you. So if somebody wants to, first of all, just what did you think of the story? Reactions to the story? What do you think um, Kahan is trying to do with this story? If you raise your hand, I'll I'll call on you. <laughs> the people get you where you yes i and i don't see the names but i see you go ahead sir uh <clears throat> michael oh, yeah. yeah yeah um i i think i mean it it, it i think I think he was, um, I, I think he was ultimately trying to talk about, to show the, um, how hard it was there, how, how much poverty there was there, that her dream, Goldie's dream that, or, or plan that will throw this big wedding and will reap the rewards of all these gifts. And that will set them up in a very fine way. She's obviously a very materialistic uh, <laughs> person. Uh, but yet she's disappointed because in fact, people are so poor they can't even, they can't afford to uh, uh, rent clothes or don't have, don't have clothes and can't afford to rent clothes to attend this uh, fine wedding that she's going to throw. And I think it shows that both their desperation to have a fine, her desperation to have a fine wedding, uh, which she says they must have before she'll even marry him. Uh, and then her dream that she's going to throw that wedding anyway, uh, turns out to be a failure, but that he is going to look forward and she joins him and is going to look forward and they'll have three months in this fine apartment. Who knows what's going to happen after that? But that, uh, you know, it's a hard life ultimately there. Good. Yeah, definitely. I think you do get a sense. Um, and he does very much sort of, everything that he writes is also kind of in this educational, there's a pedagogical component to it, right? I'm going to educate my public. I'm going to educate my readers. And there is this picture of overwhelming poverty, 
right? I mean, these are people who are living in extremely difficult conditions. Um, and you can think about sort of both her kind of dream of what a wedding would be and what that would bring to her and her vision of the future and the just intense disconnect between what she imagines will happen and then it comes crashing to reality, right? In terms of um, just how, not only how poor they are, but how poor everybody around them is. Yeah, other, I, yeah, go ahead. Um, personally, on a personal level, I had, a, I had a bit of difficulty relating to it from a family point of view. I mean, I, I had the tour of the Lower East Side by my uncle, my grandmother's brother. Mm. Um, uh, so I had con a lot of connection to it because, uh, you know, I knew what, you know, life was, but I knew it from a family point of view and a lot of my family was there, but here are two people who are in essence, uh, <clears throat> orphans, yeah. uh, and are alone in New York trying to make it. Uh, so there was a little bit, I, 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 as I was reading it, I was thinking of my, um, what I knew of, of it uh, versus their experience. So I have a question. Sure. So this was in 1898. Right. Um, how long do you think they had been here in this country? And do you think part of her dream was reminiscent to her of how things perhaps were at one time where they came from in yeah. Russia. Good, good. I think, um, so I think, I think you're, you're getting at something very important about the story, right? Which is um, let's, and you know, we can go back and look for clues in the story as to they, they've been together for um, about two years um, They've sort of had this dream of getting married for quite some time. As we know, they're orphaned, or I think in her case, maybe she- Her mother's still alive. Her mother in the old country, right? And uh, she's orphaned in that sense of being sort of this distance. And I think her, they're both orphans and they lost parents and she still has a mother in the old country. But maybe they've been here like three years or something and they're early, let's say they're newer early arrivals. Um, and. I think he does want to set this up as they're not just orphans in the um, in the physical sense of that they've actually lost their their parents or a parent. They're orphans in that they're cut off from the old world and they have to start anew in this new country, right? And what do they have? They basically only have each other. And I think there is something. I mean, it's. It's not a happy story. It's a really sad story, I think, right? I mean, we can say like, okay, they end up and they have some hopeful future together, but there's a lot of loss, I think, that's expressed in this story, both in terms of, um, you know, the, the being not connected from their family, but also the idea that, I mean, look, they have this wedding and she has these hopes. Yes, in a materialistic sense, she has the hopes of all the gifts she's going to get, but she probably also has a vision of like what weddings were like Right. in her shtetl um, in the old country. And that comes crashing to reality on this very sad wedding day, right? Um, yes, I think that um, at the end when they walked home, just the two of them from the wedding, that really expressed um, how alone emotionally they were. Right, it's just the two of them. And then they go to this empty apartment. But yeah, it was but just they, the two of them starting in the new world. And not together. just the two of them. The only it. thing that we see are these, you know, drunkards on the corner making fun of them, right, as they walk home. Um, so it kind of reinforces and, you know, it, it's, yeah, it reinforces just how sort of um, difficult their situation is. Other thoughts? Yes, I see a hand in the middle of my screen. Um, go ahead. Uh, my question is, was this written in English or was this written in Yiddish? As I was reading it, it had the cadence of Yiddish to me. 
Okay. Um, and then there were some phrases that sounded as if they should have been Yiddish. Um, so was he writing in English or in Yiddish? Yeah. So, so um, very good question. Um, it, he writes both. So this collection, um, this story itself, which is published in 1898, comes from a collection called The Imported Bridegroom and Other Stories of the New York Ghetto. Um, it's published, and I think that he publishes it originally in English and then translates it into Yiddish. So there's something like Yekel, which I mentioned before, is also written originally in English and then translated into Yiddish. So he's writing for two audiences. Yeah, did you want to add to that? Terms no, of, no, oh, thank you. Um, so, I mean, where did he learn English? Uh, Only when he arrived in uh, yes. New York? And basically completely self-taught. Wow, quick study. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and I think sort of through his work as a journalist, yeah, it's, it's quite impressive. He's a really yeah. amazing figure. Um, by the way, so um, Yeckel, which Hester Street, is his most famous creation. There's another novel he writes called The Rise of David Levinsky, um, which uh, if you you know want to read more of his work, and in that story, it's this character, this title character, David Levinsky, who in some sense, you know, Kahan wanted to educate his audience about like this, the, the American dream. So you're coming here, you're striving, you want to do well and succeed and get rich. And we have this character, David Levinsky in that story who becomes like kind of like a clothing tycoon, right? Like works his way up from um, a poor tailor to owning a business. But there's also this sense of like, you know, don't forget where you came from, right? Don't completely assimilate and Americanize and forget who you are. So he's always trying to teach his audience um, in, that, in that way. Would his audience have included um, non-Jews? Because it seems, I mean, the fact that he's writing in English would, would make me think that. And it would make me think that he wanted to sort of didactically sort of uh, explain um, something about his culture, about the uh, Jewish culture in Lower East Side, so that others uh, non-Jews would have more of a, you know, more of a, um, a picture of it. And so he, I find it very sad, but I also find his portrayal, um, uh, you know, yes, they're naive, yes, they're young, but they are, you know, they're hardworking, they're, there's a lot of um, characteristics that he uh, impute, you know, that he gives these, these two, this, these two young kids. Um, that are very uh, admirable. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think there's some there's something very interesting going on here, and it's it's actually similar to um, if you read Yackel or any of his works that I think he is writing with two audiences in mind at the same time. And um, other scholars have gone through and compared his uh, his English versions to his Yiddish versions because that's interesting too, right? Like. When you write the same story in English and in Yiddish, there are things that you can do with a translation that will tailor the audience that you're writing for. And so I think when we read in English, we have to think about like, he is very much also attuned to, I want to convey to an American English reading audience what it's like to be a, an immigrant struggling on the Lower East Side, right? What it's like to um, live such a difficult life. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Don't you think that there is a universal approach to this story that you could, it could be any young couple coming to a new country, coming to America. Um, they may have come from another country where they had important careers. He was embarrassed. He didn't want her, her to see him being a peddler. Um, any kind of immigration does this to people. It lowers their standard of living. You're sort of starting all over again. So I, I felt as I read it, it could apply to things that we see on the news every day today. Yeah, and I think that's an excellent point. I mean, I think one of the poignant parts about it, reading it is, and we don't often think about the Jewish migration 
in this in these terms, but you have you know uh, literally hundreds of thousands of people coming in, um, living incredibly difficult lives in grinding poverty, not knowing you know not having enough to put two pennies together to save for the next day to, and she has and I think that idea of like this dream wedding um, that. You know, how am I going to get enough money? I'm going to throw a wedding and everybody's going to come and give me amazing presents. And of course, she gets nothing, just reinforces just how impoverished they are, right? And I think that it is poignant when we think about, you know, the present day plight of, of migrants and refugees, right? And, um, it, and I think, I appreciate that even when we read Kahan today and we think about what message he might be trying to convey to his contemporary audience, I think he, you know, we, it resonates with us, but also at the time you can think about how he might be trying to say to people like, don't look down on these people, right? Because it's often the tendency, you know, he, he's probably thinking to himself, like, I also have to think about anti-Semitism and I have to make sure that people don't look down on these Jewish immigrants and don't think of them as poor and dirty and um, unable to assimilate into American culture, like these people are striving to work hard and to make it here. And I want to convey to an audience just that they're good people, right? Um, and they, they also want to achieve the American dream, so to speak. Um, yeah, so Fran, do you want to say more about your comment? Oh, sure. I'm not going to remember. I think the story is called um, A Christmas Present but a husband and a wife each adore each other and they're very oh, yeah. limited circumstances. And she has very beautiful long hair and he's always coveted a watch. Yeah. So uh, she sells her hair to buy him a watch and he sells something of importance to him to buy her a comb for the hair that no longer exists. And it's um, just both very beautiful and heartbreaking. Yeah. at the same time. And I think it's, you know, it overlaps it's a bit later, but a lot of his stories have this kind of quality, these kinds of qualities. Interesting. And I think it's, um, I'm glad you point that out because, so Kahan is an example, but there are a lot of writers um, writing in Yiddish at this time um, who are newer, newly arrived immigrants who are sort of functioning in this American context, writing for a, a Yiddish audience, but also functioning in a broader English audience, um, there is this interaction that's taking place, right? Where they're in dialogue with other writers around them. And, um, and you can see, so it's, it's both Jewish literature, but this is American literature as well. It's part of now a new strand of American literature. Um, this Kahan story, so yeah, it's, it, I remember that O. o Henry story, which is so interesting. It also reminds me of stories by I.L. Peretz, um, who is mm. a Yiddish literary you know, writer who writes these short stories that have important moral messages too. So I think there's like this dialogue that might be going on both with my new American context and um, with uh, you know, the, the Jewish context, Jewish literature. Rachel, yeah, I see your hand. Go ahead. Um, you, you've referenced both of these uh, items. Growing up in Brooklyn in the 1950s, um, I, I didn't experience any anti-Semitism because everybody was Jewish, but an enormous amount of in-group prejudice. Hmm. So in New York City, the German Jews thought they were a cat's meow and the European Jews were, you know, less, less. Um, and um, uh, the Glitzianas and the Litvaks had a whole separate thing right. going on. So I wonder if, um, if Kahan is speaking to the elite Jews as well. I think that's an excellent point. And I think, yes, I mean, that's part of his reading audience, right? And, and I think, um, you know, what's so, it's a, it's a great point because what's so interesting about what's happening in terms of the dynamics of the Jewish community in New York in the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s is you have, you know, there's half a million Jews living under Houston Street. You have the wealthy Jews, um, the quote unquote uptown Jews who are, in many cases, financing you know uh, aid societies to try to help these Jews to get them out of these impoverished conditions. Um, people like Jacob Schiff, for example, is, is one of the famous examples. Or creating like the visiting nervous uh, visiting nurses um, association, right, to 
um, you know, uh, uh, provide for, for the, the new immigrants, get them out of the tenement houses, improve the hygienic conditions, um, the Henry Street settlement. And sometimes like the Baron de Hirsch, who's trying to get Jews to move out of New York, right? Which there are efforts to get Jews to move to farms in Connecticut, you know, because- Colchester. <laughs> Colchester, it's a perfect example. Or in, in New Jersey, if people are familiar with like Vineland in South Jersey, it's overcrowded. There's too many Jews in New York and it, they're living in horrible conditions and they're trying to convince them. I mean, that's a whole other story, like become farmers and grow potatoes in the rocky, you know, uh, Connecticut soil. I don't know, but there is this idea, you know, or chicken farmers, people are going to make you chicken farmers. And what's behind that is the uptown Jews kind of financing these efforts to improve their lot. And I think you're right. Kahan is also thinking about them as his audience and like, I want to humanize these people yeah. for you. I want you to know how difficult life is for them. Thank you. It, it, in the story, she sends <coughs> invitations to Russia mm. uh, containing some expensive threads of material. It would appear that maybe her condition in Russia was better financially than it was in New York. And what he is essentially saying it ain't true. Don't think of going back. Right. Russia. right. Yeah. And, and I think that's a great point also, right? Like, and it's all relative. So mm -hmm. you might have come from a shtetl where your family was considered to be, you know, the elite. Yeah. And, um, and you felt like you guys lived comfortably and you had great circumstances, but you were still in Russia living under the czar, under the threat of possible persecution without economic prospects for your future. America's better. America's a more progressive country. Your job prospects are gonna be better. You can get an education here. Women, you wouldn't have been able to get that education, right? Like think about that letter that he writes. So all of those things I think don't look back, right? It will get better. Um, and it's a kind of a warning to her as well. Uh, Jay, is that, I see your hand. Yeah. yeah. Um, was there, you know, before, at the beginning of the story, they have some money, a little over a hundred mm -hmm. bucks. And, right. a, and he, is, he works as a hat blocker or whatever that is. Um, and it's fading. Is there a recession going on at, at this time? Uh, it's a good, that's a good question. I don't, I know that between the 1870s and the 1890s, actually the U.S. economy was in a recession. I think that by this point in time, maybe things are getting better, but I think in general for these newly arrived immigrants, it's very difficult, you know, like he's, he's working and maybe there is a recession. I don't know. Somebody can go in and look at New York in 1898 and look at the economic situation. It's an interesting question. I think, um, you know, he's peddling, there's not enough. And for, for, you know, part of it, there's not enough work. And part of it is, you know, this sort of people who are working in the garment business, if somebody came to you and said, I need a hundred coats by tomorrow. And, you know, it's, I'll give you a penny a coat. And if you say to them, you know, that's not enough. They go to the next guy who says, I'll do it for half a penny, right? Or whatever. So the competition is so intense and they're so dependent. It's not like a steady line of work. Um, it's piecemeal. You're paid by the piece. The, you could see a scenario where somebody like this, like, well, he's waiting for a job to come along is out on the streets peddling, right? Um, and trying to make ends meet. Avi, um, I also saw a really strong element of um, sort of a cautionary tale, um, um, the moral, the author's message, take away from this that don't be quite so impetuous, don't be so foolish. Mm -hmm. Think about, um, you know, have your dreams, but don't bet everything on red, you know, I mean, don't, um, sort of in that didactic way that is, um, you know, that sounds like the kind of thing he was doing also in his ad advice column. Right. He's trying to leave young people who might read this with a couple of messages, including be a little conservative about there, your money, there about is the a, future. Uh, 
there's a another Yiddish proverb that goes, um, abyssal and abyssal, machta full of shissel, which means little by little, you'll get a full bowl. And in this case, Goldie is going for the overflowing bowl in one shot with the wedding. And Kahan is, seems to be saying, just keep, be patient, right? Keep working one step in front of the other one day, right? And just little by little, things are going to get better. And I think there is that moral lesson in the story, right? Like, don't try to go for it all in one shot. Just keep, you know, be patient, keep working one day at a time and things will improve. And there's also a subtle ending. I, when I looked at it first, I wanted to make sure I had all 14, you know, that the story was ending here. I wasn't sure. Uh, he's uh, saying, uh, you know, that love is, and, com and starting out with your intended is much more important than the, uh, than the- uh, Sorry, I'm scrolling down to the end. Go ahead, yeah. That, that, that it's uh, much more important than the uh, stuff. thing, stuff. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, that's the, uh, they do have love, but there's another Yiddish, I got a Yiddish things for everything, but um, <laughs> it, you know, in English, there's one that's basically like love don't pay the bills, right? So <laughs> there's this component to that also, right? Um, or you could say in Kemach and Torah, right? If you don't have flour, you can't study Torah, right? You need flour to make bread. Um, so that like she shouldn't live just on the dreams of her, you know, love her lovely relationship and her wedding, right? She's gotta stay grounded. And I think he's trying to tell her that too. All right, my friends. So um, I did want to mention before we wrap up for today, um, there is a wonderful new book. It's not one of my books, it's a book of a friend um, that's uh, very relevant for our class. Um, and uh, you can see it here, it's called How Yiddish Changed America and How America Changed Yiddish. And it's an anthology that um, was put together by the Yiddish Book Center uh, in, in Northampton, if you're familiar with the Yiddish Book Center. Um, I think in honor of their 40th anniversary, they, they came out with this anthology. It's edited, <coughs> excuse me, it's edited by uh, Elon Stavins and Josh Lambert. So some of you might uh, know Josh who um, used to live here in West Hartford. He actually just recently moved to Boston. This is a very nice collection of kind of uh, Yiddish in America, Yiddish literature in America. So um, highly recommended. And uh, anyway, so next week we will um, continue. I, I, you should have the readings. My email's on the email that you got, just email me if you need anything, but um, you should have the readings of the Isaac Besheva Singer uh, story, Gimple the Fool, and the commentary on that story called Who is the Fool, um, which I, everybody has that? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Good. I sent all the attachments that you um, had sent to me, so it was, I think it was in there. Great. Okay. Just let me know if you need anything, and um, we will reconvene next Friday. Okay. Sei gesund. Sei gesund. Be healthy. Be safe. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.